Okay, good morning, students, professors, and researchers. My name is Ludmila Belotti Andreofono, and I am one of the responsibles for conducting and mediating this seventh discussion session during Georgetown University and UNESCO University Telefunding Online Exchange Seminars. Uh, my friend Nivia Maria Assunção da Costa is the uh, responsible mediator. She's the responsible for our debate. And this morning, three researchers will introduce us their academic works. Um, first, Sidney Antonio Pereira Filho, then Guilherme Mariano Martins da Silva, and finally, Lucas Menekeli Garcia da Costa. After their presentations, after their speech, we will be able to start our uh, precious debate. Please uh, organize your questions, writing them on the chat so Nivia can uh, prepare uh, uh, everything for the debate. Uh, the chat is available on your right hand side on the Zoom screen. Uh, thank you very much. I hope we enjoy it. Let's go. Hello, everyone. My name is Sidney Antonio Pereira Filho. I'm a master's student at UNESP São José do Rio Preto, and the name of my ongoing research is Peer Correction in Oral English Teletandem Sessions. Here, I introduce teletandem and its principles, as well as the context of my research. My research objective is to describe how an American student, for example, who participated in the Teletunda in more than one semester, corrects the oral production in English of his Brazilian partner during the oral Teletunda sessions. The aim of this objective is to answer the following research question. How is peer correction characterized during English oral Teletunda sessions by the same participant over two semesters? The present research presents teletandem modalities according to the characteristics of the context, how assessment in the context of integrated institutional teletandem is, feedback, corrective feedback. And it's important to mention here what feedback is. A reaction or reactions of the more competent peer to questions or mistakes of the learner with a view to learning the language. Studies carried out in bilingual telecollaborative environments show that the correction during synchronous interactions, oral or written, occurs through certain categories of corrective feedback. Explicit correction and recache are most commonly found in these studies. This is a qualitative research of an interpretive nature. It's a case study from a longitudinal perspective. The data used are in MOTEC, Multimodal Teletandem Corpus. And in this research, we try to identify how error correction occurs during interaction in English. We try to compare and contrast these moments with the correction categories already described in other studies and maybe check for new categories. That of the focal participants for the first and second semester was analyzed in order to describe the corrective feedback in English offered by the foreigner, that is, the more competent partner, through an error or inadequacy or linguistic failure that the apprentice comes to commit. In this way, we can present how this moment of correction by peers is characterized in this study. The preliminary analysis of the data reveals that when the more competent partner offers feedback, there is a preference for recast corroborating the findings of previous studies. Here there are two examples, but there are more, okay, in the first semester of 2012, but I try to limit it due to time. These corrective moments were identified as recast, okay, and when the more competent partner, the foreigner, corrected the sentence uh, implicitly, okay? 
So, for example, in this first example, we have a problem about the preposition, you know, there is no preposition there in the Brazilian talk, for example, ah, me too, I wake, woke up six, and ah, you wake up at six, okay, and uh, considering the second example, we have a phonological error, okay, about the word uh, trimester, uh, the Brazilian said trimesters, Okay, and the same, the foreigner partner corrected uh, implicitly. Oh, trimester? Okay, okay. Considering the second semester of 2012, that I show that when the more competent partner offers feedback, the recast category appears more in evidence, corroborating previous studies. On the other hand, another category more conducive to negotiation of meaning form that resembles regular classroom environments has emerged. It did not happen often. However, when it was identified, therefore, we observed a positive telecollaborative exchange. Considering the second semester of 2012, in the first example, we have a pronunciation problem that made the foreigner ask her partner. This moment was identified as clarification request when uh, he says here, wait, people are going to go arrested, okay? And about the second example, there is a clear evidence of the request. There was a grammatical problem and the more competent partner offered feedback as seen in it's relaxing, right? In order to characterize longitudinal peer correction, the data revealed that such corrective practice, corroborating Flesky 2017, presents itself as formative by appropriating the apprentices or production by providing feedback direct, since the feedback offered during the oral session exposes the form considered correct by the American, or even considering the context, the expected form, not allowing, in most cases, the apprentice to reflect on his oral production, focused on grammatical vocabulary and speech aspects, and not explicit. So, thank you very much for watching my video, and feel free to comment on my work that is in progress, okay? Thank you. Hello everyone, hope you are all well and safe during these difficult times. My name is Guilherme Mariano, and I teach North American Literature at URCA. Today, however, we are going to be discussing teacher education. This presentation was created aiming to share the experiences lived by three professors during the building and execution process of a didactic material in a teacher education course. We had a larger team, but the professors involved whose experiences I, I share now, and you can see them here, are Dr. Ana Carolina Negrão Berlin de Andrade from São Velho and Mr. Uh, Master Isidoro Alves Donato from the Production Engineering course and myself included. The teacher education course was created during the COVID-19 pandemic and it was done with urgency. So the team had to prepare everything in only two weeks. We chose to use the G Suite tools, Google Classroom and Google Meet because Wirka had just started using these on an institutional level. The course was thus executed aiming to minimize the pedagogical impact caused by the pandemic context, which forced the transference of regular activities to the remote format. The, the pandemic arrived in force in Brazil during March. However, the course was only executed in July uh, this delay happened for several reasons. First, no one expected the pandemic to last that long. Second, the provisions set by the university did not obligate the professors to continue the activities online, right, to do the transferences. And number three, there was a strong resistance to the remote teaching format by the professors. By July, however, there was no more escape. 
It was already the end of the semester and many professors had not given lectures yet, while a few, myself included, had already finished the whole courses or were close to it. The new provision set by the university continued the state of remote teaching and there was and there is not even today a possibility for returning to normal conditions. So the scenery, uh, so the context changed, right? Uh, but the timetable to actually develop the course was short and the team was assembled really fast. We then created a basic didactic material for both applications, Meet in Classroom, and executed the courses sessions in three days, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of July, dividing morning for one app and afternoon for the other, using four hours each period. We had a massive adherence as more than 200 teachers watched the course on every, on, on every period, right? So it was well received. Having this in mind, we intended to discuss the teacher education process and the teaching learning process in information and communication technologies in its context. As a, theor uh, as a theoretical framework, we adopted the concepts of egotics uh, from whom we use the concept of scaffolding and zone of proximal development. Because these two concepts have double importance in the course. First, it is applied to the relationship between teacher and students. And secondly, in the activities proposed to the departments as they were created in the tandem format, in the relation student-student, right? It's important to note that it was a teacher education course made by professors of the same university to other colleagues. So we created the course to present it to our colleagues, to our equals. Beforehand, it was taken into account the diverse backgrounds and the difficulty in the course and material elaboration was achieving a middle ground between the most basic knowledge and the innovative uses the tools might have. With that in view, we approached the course with an open dialogue, where pauses were made for doubts to be explained, and in those moments, we noticed the more advanced conversations were later, were later re-explained in the chat by other colleagues, in order to simplify and make it accessible to beginners. So during the course, we perceived the other students act as mediators between the knowledge and their colleagues, both in dialogues made in the video conference and in the chat. This was evidence that there were different levels of development between the teachers as their previous knowledges of ICT was already different. What we noticed, however, was that the difference in level of knowledge was outstanding. While we had very difficult uh, questions such as the use of other tools to complement streaming or the dividing the computer display to show both the video conference and the PowerPoint presentation. On the other hand, we had basic confusion regarding the Google Meet layout, with confusions regarding what was being presented and what was actually the own student's desktop. So this, ev this evidence, this showed us uh, that we would not be able to reach a full development of all teachers during the course, as it was a short period of time. Having that in mind, uh, having in mind that we already were using and enabling scaffolding in the sessions, right? The one uh, teacher helping the other teacher uh, during the session to learn, to achieve, so one student helping the other, we decided to widen its approach after the course ended. As a continuation to the training program, we motivated the professors to form tandem groups inside their own departments. There, they would act as teacher students, helping each other according to their knowledge of Google Meet and Google Classroom. This was apparently well received. We then appointed this as a practice activity for all who enrolled in the course and suggested that they share their experiences with other members of their departments who did not participate in their training. In this aspect, Lobo and Maya point out how it is important for teachers to be constantly trained and up to date with the recent, recent technologies. Not for any possible substitution, 
but for the ability to adapt the classroom towards a generation with different technological edges. They highlight the importance of the teacher-student relationship as protagonists in the educational process and how technology may help advance it. After the course, we received very positive feedback from our colleagues. Many perceived that the initial difficulty could be overcome and they required more courses. Unfortunately, we still could not create a new one, but the team is reassembling for further activities. To conclude, the pandemic made plain to us that teacher education in ICT, ICT is extremely necessary at work. Some teachers are having a difficult, a difficult time grasping the basic use of Google Meet. However, there were also pedagogical issues, as some teachers who pointed out difficulties with uh, Meet were, at the same time, proficient users of WhatsApp. Then why not use this app as a tool to reach your students? That was our question, right? Besides the technological know-how, there must be a constant perception of pedagogical needs. Sometimes these needs may be overlooked by teachers who adhere to only one tool when the students clearly need something different. We aim, uh, our aim is to produce more material and training aiming to not only reach a desirable learning level in ICTS, but in the application of these technologies and communication information technologies to solve pedagogical needs. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. I'd like to say thank you to Professor Guilherme for his presentation. And our next presentation uh, will be presented by Lucas Minichetti Garcia da Costa. Hold on just for a while. Good day. Share screen. Good day to you all. My name is Lucas Menekeli and I'm a master's degree student under the supervision of Dr. Solange Aranha from UNESP São José do Rio Preto, São Paulo, Brazil. In this presentation, I focus on culture-related episodes in learning journals within teleattendant context. First, I'm going to briefly present two cultural studies within telecollaborative contexts that supported this study. Following that, I'm going to present five different dimensions of how culture can be seen in telecollaborative projects, as presented by Levy in 2007. Also, I'm going to present the motivation and the objectives, and the objective of this presentation. Then, the methodology of the study is presented, as well as how those dimensions can appear in teleattendant moral sessions from one pair of participants. This study was motivated by the fact that although there has been plenty of research on cultural studies in teleattendant co context, culture still remains as a complex concept. More research on this topic, especially in a telecollaborative context such as teleattending, is needed in order to amplify the outcomes for learning a different culture mediated by technology. So, the objective of this presentation is to show how five dimensions of culture can appear in teleattendant moral sessions of one pair of participants of the teleattendant project in São José do Rio Preto. In order to achieve that, I briefly present the different dimensions of culture in telecollaborative projects as proposed by Levy in 2007. There are five. Culture is elemental, when culture is understood as being inherited at birth, culture is relative, when it's understood in comparison with itself, culture as membership to a group, when it shows culture as being part of a group, culture as context, contested, when it's related to cultural shock and it causes a discomfort, and culture as individual, it means that people understand their own culture in a variable and multiple and individual way. The instruments of this research are learning journals, which are stored in Motec, the multimodal teleattendant corpus, with over 500 hours of oral sessions and 600 learning journals. 
the study focuses on journals written in English, which make a total of 57,972 words. As far as methodology goes, the study is div divided into five steps, as the picture shows. Teles, Akira, and Funo in 2015 have already mentioned some keywords that can be responsible for culture-related episodes in teletending. For those keywords, through Linksbox, it is possible to separate the learning journals in which cultural episodes appear, and the correspondent teletender model sessions are transcripted in order to analyze the dimensions of culture. The frequency of the word selected is shown in this picture. Next, I show how the dimensions of culture can appear in culture-related episodes from oral sessions of one pair of participants of the partnership between Unesti Rio Preto and UGA, University of Georgia, in 2015. By searching for the keyword movie, it is possible to read in the diary the participants were discussing which Brazilian movies the American partner has watched. In this excerpt, it is possible to find culture as elemental in the American participant when he confirms that everybody from America loves Bang Bang, assuming it is an inherited part of their culture. In the same diary, an excerpt of the oral session, it is possible to see culture as membership to a group when both American and Brazilian participants share the same opinion about the movie City of God. By agreeing that everybody who's learning Portuguese has watched that movie, both participants share the same characteristics of a culture. Still, in the same diary, but a different moment of the oral session, it is possible to see culture as being contested in the American participant the moment he questions the fact that his partner hasn't watched a particular Brazilian movie. It didn't necessarily cause him a discomfort, but the fact that he repeated the name of the movie shows his cultural expectations and representations were not met. Although the keyword searched was movie, the discussion in the oral session was about another cultural topic, trips. In this part of the session, it is possible to see culture as individual, variable and multiple, when the American participant talks about how Times Square is terrible and how his partner is shocked. Although he's part of a major culture, the American one, he seems to understand it differently than others from the community and from his partner as well. Following that conversation, it is also possible to point out culture as relative when the Brazilian participant compares the idea of Times Square being Disney World, which means full of tourists, with Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro. She compares his culture with hers in an attempt to understand his point of view. Lastly, I bring some considerations about the study. The first one is, journals don't always present the same culture-related episode which can be seen in the teletender moral sessions. Sometimes students write that a specific cultural moment has happened, but in the oral session that moment is brief or barely discussed. Another consideration is that it is possible to find more than one dimension of culture in a single excerpt or teletendem oral session as a whole. As Thales Akin and Funo pointed out in 2015, it is difficult to separate them in one episode. And last, some dimensions will occur more than others. These are the references for my study. And this is my email. Thank you for watching the presentation. Now I think we can start uh, our debate session. It will be mediated by Nivea Maria Sulsão Costa. Uh, and before that, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Sidney Antonio Pereira Filho, Guilherme Maria Martins Silva, and Lucas Manichelli Garcia da Costa for their brilliant presentations. Hello, everyone. So uh, before I open to the questions, I would say two. Uh, Sidney, Guilherme, and Lucas, congratulations on your video presentation. Yeah, as we all know, uh, this moment here gives us the possibility to understand how telecorroboration works. Um, I mean, how it helps us to understand, for example, about uh, the development of a target language or about peer correction. Oh, about uh, technology, about the role of the role of the teacher and the students in telecollaborative situations, or about the dimensions of um, uh, of culture, 
about interaction, contacts, competences, strategies, and finally a lot of points. So thank you all for sharing your experience with uh, telecollaborative research. Okay. And uh, now let's go to the questions and the answers. We have uh, a question here, the first question from Martha uh, to Sidney. To so before that, she says, uh, she gives congratulations to the presenters. And about her question we have, uh, do students have any training to provide correction to, to each other before the exchange? No, they don't have at all. They have a tutorial, and in this tutorial, uh, we should say to them that they have to contribute to the other learning, uh, correcting, but they don't have a specific, you know, uh, training for them to provide feedback, but they have to provide because it's mentioned uh, in the tutorial. All right. Um, does anybody have any question here? So, a, a second question from Martha. Uh, is the correction incidental or partners negotiated? What type of correction do you like to get from their partners? Uh, is the correction incidental? Okay, they negotiate. Okay, for example, before starting the Teletumbling, correct? Uh, they have the tutorial, and then during the first uh, session, okay, they negotiate the way they are going to be corrected, okay? And let me see the, the final of the question here. Those are the type of correction they use like to, Yes, and they have some goals, right? So during the initial questionnaire, they need to, to express themselves what, do they, what they want from these telecollaborative practice. So this, what they want, is going to be the, um, is going to help them to achieve, okay? So promoting negotiation, you know, during the practice, during the, the telecollaborative exchange. So their partner is going to know, okay, uh, the way uh, they want to be corrected. So basically everything is about the negotiation here. Um, do, thank you, Ney. It's that that's exactly what happens. But uh, I'd like just to add, Marta. I think it, I think this is a, a key question because they they actually do not have a training, as Sydney mentioned. But uh, during the tutorial, we we emphasize the need to understand that if they correct too much, they are going to break the flow of communication. But if they don't correct at all, their partners might feel there is no, like they make no errors and this is also not good for learning. So we, we, we tell them that they should negotiate and discuss if they want to be corrected at the moment uh, that, the, that the error happens or if they want to make, note, take, make notes and send to, to the partner later. So we, we, we give them some ideas of how, but there is no training. And uh, in fact, this, even though we emphasize the need for the negotiation, I don't know if all of them do. I hope they do, but <laughs> we don't know. I think the pair uh, may uh, is focusing, uh, the data he's using, uh, they, they did, they tried to negotiate, but I, I, do, I don't believe that all of them do. I would like to add something too. I have been noting that at this moment of teletending history, some of teletending uh, participants, they are kind of so used to, to do teletending, they're doing teletending for the second or third semester, that they uh, do it implicitly sometimes, like negotiating how to correct. I mean, they don't do it as explicitly as the first time we interact. And uh, I note that nowadays the, the students are much more aware about how to interact, about how to behave in this uh, multimodal context than we were when we started researching teletending. 
So yes, they they know, and and most of the the students who participate in this um, in this context, they are university students, they are master degree students, PhD students. So they are aware of the importance of learning. Yeah, and that helps a lot. They are aware of the importance of uh, the reciprocity during telephony session and autonomy. So I think that it helps a lot. Sorry for interrupting. All right, uh, Sidney, uh, I have something to, to say. Uh, according to, to, your, to, to your video presentation, your ex explanation, I see two important keywords for correction. So, uh, for example, in my opinion, it is interaction, competence, and context. So, uh, I have a question uh, thinking about these three keywords. So, how do you see the role of each of them for peer uh, About competence. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. can you can you question again because my audio? Okay, I think I okay, had some problem. problem. Uh, because I, I see twenty words. Yeah, in your research, uh, it, uh, they are interaction. Yeah, uh, competence and the uh, um, context. So my question is, uh, how do you see the role of each of, each of them for correction? The role of the interaction, okay. the competence, and the context for correction. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, we need to understand this context is, uh, I, I say, I think an informal context and interaction uh, they're going to interact all the time, you know, for them to grow, for them to learn something from the other. So this is about uh, Vygotsky, you know, social interaction. And we have one more competent than the other in terms of language proficiency, you know, in terms of language proficiency. So one needs, one needs to contribute to the other, you know, following the principle of teletandem, you know, that is, Reciprocity, for example. Uh, so that's about, I don't know if I answered, but <laughs> it, it's about one uh, having a, a, a level, you know, a higher level, you know, in terms of language, to, to make the other to, to know something to, to be better at languages, for example, at English language, in this sense. I got it, I got it. thank you. Um, I think when we're talking about telecollaboration, um, I think um, that everything occurs in and by interaction, yeah? Um, however, in order to keep the interaction, the partners need to use their competence, um, the context, the situation. It depends on the context, yeah? On the situation. So thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Marta, uh, Says thank you very much, yeah, for your answer. And she, she says here, I asked about previous training because in my context, sometimes the students have problems explaining the rationale for correction, even though they are studying to become English teachers. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I have a question for Guilherme, Professor Guilherme. Right. Uh, Professor Guilherme, you told us that there were quite a resistance uh, by the uh, URCA professors concerning to technology. Uh, how, how does it work? How is this resistance? Could you explain, please? On guys. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> No problem. Uh, we had some resistance and it goes in more than one way, right? Uh, uh, in one scenario, we have actually a problem that is student access. And we actually do have this problem because we made a, a, a kind of research and it was uh, done by Isidorio. And we actually had to guess a little bit because 
uh, it, it, it was similarly done at, U, at UNASP, I believe. It was an online, online research. So in a way, you, you, you suppose students who didn't answer uh, do not have access, right? But we did a, a secondary research as well, which was conduc conducted based on income. And thinking that students who have a really low income probably do not have access or are going to have a very limited access to internet and communication, right? And we have in courses like artists, right, visual arts here, and uh, drama in our drama course, 80% of the students uh, are in this uh, area of known access, like very low income students. So the, the whole department of visual arts and drama refused to, to adhere to remote access, uh, remote uh, classes because their their students do not have access. Okay, it's it's very comp comprehensible uh, in this way. On the other hand, we still have some uh, issues regarding teachers who see uh, online education. Uh, they use on um, online technologies and classes being ministered online. And something lesser or lesser or how can we say it like adhering in a way or violating uh, the profession and going to a, a liberal market for the market uh, education like uh, compromising with uh, futurity for instance right uh, and things like that. So we have a problem which is a real problem, which is students access. So it's like material problem we do have, we suffer with it. But we also had an ideological problem uh, at the time. And the third problem that would see it would be like actually difficult to access. We had, we had people who actually suffered physical uh, pain in the <laughs> in the course, in the teacher education course. And it actually happened. There was a professor who, it's a very old man. And, and it, I, I was a little bit, uh, it was my problem because it was the day I, I gave the course, like, and, and he, he fainted. So it was, it was not like, uh, it was a physical experience, really. So it was someone who had really difficult time dealing with technology because it was not part of his uh, of his life. But it was at the same time, it was beautiful to see that he he had that difficult and he was uh, that focused on learning it to reach his students, right? Uh, but we we had this this difficult. Uh, uh, time dealing with that. I don't know if I'm answering or if I went all over the place. That's what sometimes I do. So sorry. All right. So we have a question here from Susie. Uh, for you, Guilherme. Um, I have a question. Oh, no. Sorry. For uh, Lucas. <laughs> uh, to Lucas. Can you comment on how? or why you choose the word to search for a culture related event in your course? Um, yes, hi everyone. Um, so as I, as I mentioned on my presentation, uh, there is a study conducted by Telis, Akir and Funo uh, in, a, uh, in their context in Assis. Hi, Majumila. <laughs> and then um, they have already mentioned in that study that some uh, topics were or could be uh, uh, responsible for creating or for emerging those culture related episodes. Um, so talking about soccer or music or politics or university life or some of those topics, they could be responsible for those culture related episode, episodes. So what I did was uh, looking at those topics I uh, separated some words that I, I thought could uh, uh, appear on the diaries and then maybe be responsible for those 
culture related episodes in the sessions. Uh, okay, can I can I just uh, add something? That's, yeah. I, I think uh, that's that's a good. Uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. And um, after you, I I won't talk to you. Sorry. You go ahead, Ludmila. So I was just trying to elucidate that the movement was from the data to the theory. So first we saw the material we had, and then we we read it carefully. We saw some. Um, occurrences that were uh, more present than others and then we started thinking about categories based on the data and then these words emerged yeah. so it was not a top-down uh, aspect so first we, we look at the data so uh, what I'm trying to say is that different data may have different uh, manifestations of categories so uh, we should be really careful and another uh, aspect that we should be careful is that we are talking about cultural related episodes. And before talking about cultural related episodes, we must have a deep understanding of what we understand about culture. Yeah. That is a, a very radical aspect, fundamental aspect of the research that we need to look carefully of what do we understand about culture and uh, which meanings are being built concerning to culture in the data? Because sometimes uh, we may be lead to understand, for example, uh, having different opinions by cultural shock or agreeing concerning to one opinion as being a member uh, or membership, cultural membership, a cultural membership episode, and is far deeper than that. So, uh, it was just something that I had difficult in my study and I want to show you how it was difficult to me uh, and explaining so maybe it can help you somehow. Thank you and sorry for interrupting. Yeah, well, basically Ludmila said what I was going to, but uh, also uh, um, I was going to ask you if uh, during the analysis, if uh, haven't you found other categories others that did not appear in, in previous uh, papers or research? Yes, uh, there were some words that I, um, that I found zero occurrences in the, in the data, in the corpus. Um, and there were some words that I knew could pop out more than others. For example, movies is one of those, especially because that's um, related to one of the tasks the students have to uh, to be part of during the, 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 the time of the project. So they have to watch movies and uh, they have to either write about that movie or talk about that um, uh, text in the oral session. So I knew that if I, if I searched for movies in the corpus, especially in the English corpus, I would find a lot of uh, occurrences, and that's what I and that's what happened. There were 256 occurrences of the word movies. Uh, so I knew, and that's not one of the categories previous studies uh, have uh, shown. So I I knew that some words would come out more than others. Can I say one more thing as a suggestion? Um, I would suggest you to read Leila da Costa PhD thesis because she talks about identity and culture too and she has a, a piece of conversation in her material that came really clear in my mind just right now when two uh, male partnerships, one from the USA and another Brazil, you start talking about a party and they start uh, sharing knowledge about a drink that mm -hmm. uh, would be nice to give to the girls the girls would be drunk and easy to to flirt you see to to interact in uh in this uh, way and i i understand myself that in this it is a cultural episode they are talk they are sharing a, a drink recipe okay but they are sharing a very patriarchal understanding of life and it is membership because they are males, because they are sharing an understanding about how to deal with girls in party, about how to dominate, about how to have sexual 
uh, interaction, uh, not uh, uh, sexual in a pornographic way, but uh, in this interaction male for male thing. And I think that this is a very good example uh, for us to think about uh, cultural related episodes as membership. Uh, when we involve two different people that are from different nationalities and which has different uh, relation power. For example, the USA has a status, a social and economic status, and Brazilian students had another social and economic status. So they are far different. So just to suggest to you that uh, Leila da Costa uh, thesis is so wonderful that I think that everybody must re uh, read that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's th and that's exactly what you what you told. Some of the the dimensions they are very difficult to uh, to see in the interactions, um, especially a membership to a group is one of the hardest in my opinion because there are some uh, in some implicit aspects of culture that we must pay attention and like just reading or uh, watching that specific oral session I would never imagine uh, or I wouldn't think about membership to a group as uh, there but uh, some of the others are very easy to find like they are I think they are more uh, present because they represent maybe what the participants think about culture. So they're always trying to compare their, their cultures. They are, they're always trying to, to share their point of view, uh, their cultural point of view, and maybe trying to understand the others by theirs. So it's uh, some of, that's what I said at the, at the end, some uh, dimensions will appear more than others. And, um, multiple factors are involved. Uh, the, the, the oral session that I brought in this presentation uh, happened between a, a, a boy and a girl and uh, they were they were very friendly to each other. There were there weren't moments where you could feel a discomfort or embarrassment uh, and definitely he wasn't trying to flirt with her uh, during the, the, the time. Um, so that's why, in my opinion, for example, uh, culture is contested, which is where there is a discomfort, there is like this embarrassment. Um, it showed like in one minimal episode, one moment where they were talking about Disney World and whatever. So that's and the one. And it was really amazing to see that their personal impressions concerning to the cultural episode written in the diaries were far different from what you can find in data. It showed yeah. that in the personal dimension, they have a, a really great value sometimes, and it does align on the transcription. Yeah. So it is it is something really nice to see and to talk about, to see how they understand this cultural shock, and to see what exactly was the point of that discussion. Was it really about the the Cristo Redentor and the Wall Street? I asked yeah. myself, oh, yeah. are Christo Redentor and ostrich symbols are something much more important. Social exactly. representations are something much more important. And yeah. that was the cultural shock happened. So just yeah. to give you some Yeah, and that's uh, just to, to finish my, my line of thought. There is, a, there, there is my impression uh, that I analyzed for this presentation the, the learning journals written in English and uh, maybe the way they, they write about culture in that uh, moment, maybe that's because they're writing in English. Yeah. So maybe that's the idea. That's what I think. If they were re writing in Portuguese, it would be uh, much different. That's it. All right. So Lucas, it's so hard to find this dimension in it situation so my goodness yes uh, as you told us it is possible to find uh, more than one dimension of culture in a single situation but I, I had a, a question um, about one example that you uh, shared with us um, for example uh, in that part that say uh, that you 
Times Square is terrible. So what, uh, what lets you choose it as a, to classify it with a cultural individual, yeah? And why not uh, to say also an example of culture as contested? Yeah, that's the that's the the, the hardest part about it. Like, there isn't uh, a rule that tells us this one is going to be this dimension and not others. It is possible to find multiple dimensions of culture in one um, moment of the oral session. Um, my, I think my uh, personal analysis obviously goes uh, a lot into this. So when I first um, listened, watched the, the oral session, immediately I, I was like, okay, so he's part of his own culture and he understands uh, his culture in a different way. If you, if you ask others, uh, other American people about what they think of Disney World, they, most of them will say, oh, it's amazing, it's beautiful, I love it. And then he, maybe that's a shared uh, idea of uh, Disney World and Disney World and their culture and not his. It wasn't, and he was like, it's terrible. And during the, the, the session, I can obviously watch how they are reacting and how they, and how they are talking. So intonation and uh, facial expressions. So maybe that's something that can help me or could help, could have helped me to understand that, that moment as individual and not as other uh, dimension. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have a question? Guilherme, could you please explain something to me? <laughs> I read something uh, about uh, discussion, uh, to discuss about strategies in your abstract, yeah? I read something about this, so uh, I have a question, a little question. How do you see the importance to discuss uh, about strategies for teacher education with uh, telecollaboration? Could you explain something about this? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I do not even remember my abstract right now. In the <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but what we were, what I was thinking, I believe at the time, was actually uh, discussing strategies to have a continual, uh, continuous education in, in teacher education regarding ICTs to make it uh, at least at Urca, and, and that's my uh, area, right? Uh, the, where I come from, where I, I come from. Uh, to make it uh, a continual, uh, something uh, that would be regular. Because from my perspective, and that was what I, we, we suffered a little bit, when we were creating the, the didactic material, uh, I was really in doubt on how to approach that. Because for me, it was very, very basic since uh, my difficulty at the time was to make it not like something that was already at Google Help. You, if you click Google Help, Google Support, everything was there. So I was, and when someone asked me to do the material, I was, but it's everything there, right? The people, they just have to go Google Help and that, it's there. So, uh, and to not be really, really basic, Yes, uh, and at least be, be, Anna is remembering something here. And I was worried about that, but the teachers, some teachers, some professors, they did not, and she mentioned it to me now, they did not even know how to change their login at Gmail, right? So the first step to reach Google Meet or to reach the Google Classroom was to, to change the login to, to access with their uh, Urca email and they were unable to do that. So the strategies uh, that I was discussing at least were uh, to make it regular to implement uh, more basic knowledge courses 
uh, or the beginner's course that would reach these people, right? And to think on, I don't know, to think on, on, on other conditions to that. But we suffered institutional problems as well because we are all over uh, with lots of things going on. I, am, I, I, I was part of this team, but I am at, I am coordinating Wabi at the same time. I'm on the master's course as a teacher, as a professor. I am doing lots of stuff. Isidorio is also coordinating our technological department. He is on his department, he's head of his department as well. So, uh, and we had Dinter coming here and ha more than half of the, the team was going to apply to the doctor, doctorate position. Uh, so we stopped doing anything because we were, we had so many other things to do, but we have this deficiency, it is visible. And this must be something that the university work uh, creates uh, a regular course and in, uh, in other strategies regarding funding more staff, uh, regarding uh, to support it, visiting teachers and other other work. I don't know, I again, I don't know if I'm answering. Okay, so sorry. All right, thank you, I got it, thank you. Okay, so does anybody have any question? I'm not sure if you have questions, so. Mm, okay, Ujimila, you can. Just, just to comment a little bit more to, to see the sound of my own voice, so sorry. <laughs> uh, and this uh, presentation that I wanted to give was really to share this experience. It's very raw yet because it's something that we just did and, and we had to stop and we want to return to, to it with, with a better uh, input, with, with a better focus. Right, uh, but it's something that is going to be routine, right? And this is what is uh, is the problem because how to deal with it, how to make our make it easier on our colleagues. That was the uh, the attempt. And regarding pedagogical strategies, I don't know if it's what you asked, right? In this aspect, uh, I think that the the pedagogical strategies that we used where we, we did an exposition, right? But we, we wanted this to be the, the more uh, social interaction as, as possible and simulating the pairs because we are all dealing with equals and to be in a position of a teacher here is something that is uh, a little bit uh, complicated at least, right? So we simulated this, uh, this working pairs a lot so we could share things and help each other to towards the process and relied a lot in other colleagues experiences and comments and developments towards the course i don't know if this is what you aimed with strategies so i sorry yes William. i think the, the first thing to uh the first question is what kind of strategies we are talking about yeah uh, I, I mean, uh, when we think uh, about strategies uh, that you, you, uh, used by the partners, I think they give uh, they give them the possibility to to manage many situations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's just a uh, uh, yeah. It's just my opinion. So yeah, if, if, in, before we go, if I may. There is something interesting about what you say, you know, about your presentation, uh, which is the institutionalization of the practice. You know, like it's, uh, it, you know, what you, <laughs> the data, it, it's raw, you, you, may, you said, and it's true, but it's uh, very uh, strong evidence of how important it is for uh, the practice to be institutionalized, to be institutionally recognized, you know, so 
I keep saying that every every event, every conference I go, so it's I'm I'm getting you know kind of a bo the boring person, but that's very strong evidence of how key this is. If I can uh, piggyback on Susie there, if you're getting tired and old of being the bore, boring person repeating that, imagine me, you know. So um, just to reflect a little bit on technology in general, we're, we're in the last area of the university to deal with technology. Letras was the last area, you know. I have colleagues in my department that don't know how to format papers in Microsoft Word, you know. And it's a change of the guard. And it's coming quickly because technology changes quickly. And so, you know, inherent is the frustration we live every day, you know. Um, I was just going to make a comment on um, negotiation, which uh, I was going to say it earlier, but we switched questions. Uh, I, I try to impact my students with the idea that every dialogue is a negotiation, you know. And so when you're starting a conversation with someone new, get the negative ideas of what a negotiation is out of your head. You're not trying to, you know, take advantage of somebody. You're not trying to sell something. It's a different type of negotiation. And I always put the, 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 um, I always put the um, results of the survey João and I ran at Georgetown in 2015 where 92% of the students like to be corrected, but only 57% actually corrected their partners. And that shows that there's an inherent politeness. You know, you don't want to make somebody feel bad, but at the same time, you guys are there to learn. You want to learn, right? And so uh, the more transparent we are uh, upfront about all this works. Of course, it's not the only thing that does it, so over the years, uh, 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 me and some of the instructors here, what we've done is we listen to the uh, first, second interaction of the students on two speed to make it shorter, of course, because we don't have time for all of this. But we listen to it and we give them feedback and we remind them of how negotiation would have worked in these certain moments, how that would have helped, you know. and. Uh, and we've, we've noticed differences. We haven't proven anything. We haven't taken down the, the, the data or anything. We, we have the data recorded. But uh, the students themselves say, you know, my all the interactions after that, once we got that out of the way, really helped. Uh, and teletandem is, is, a natural, is a natural place for, for people to feel comfortable after three or four interactions. I, have, I had a student, the first time she ever interacted, uh, early September, and afterwards I said, how was the interaction, you know? She raised her hand immediately and she said, it was weird. I felt like I had a best friend all of a sudden, you know? <laughs> and so, of course, that doesn't happen to everybody, but it's a natural place where the hierarchy sort of dissipates and uh, walls come down. And, and people can take more advantage. So we got to remind them that even though the walls are down and that you like the other person, that there should be negotiation, there should be a conversation at least about, uh, you know, objectives and things you, would, things you would like to learn and things you think your partner thinks you need to learn. Because a lot of times we hear things in the other that the other doesn't. And all of that otherness is the, is the muddy part, you know, of, of the negotiation. Uh, that's just my two cents. Two words on that. Solange and Laura, Laura Rambazzo are writing a paper in which they are trying to define a negotiation in teletandem. Because exactly, it's not this common sense notion that we usually have, but it's yeah. also a bit different from negotiation of meaning, which is a crystallized term in our, in our uh, field of study also. So they are writing, I'm not sure it's forthcoming, I'm not sure how, when, but because exactly, that's exactly what you said, it's a key yeah. element yeah. in-, in and, and, uh, and I'll go further. Uh, aside from the, the three pillars right now, the equal amount of time, the reciprocity and the autonomy, this negotiation is going to be another essential element to address before every teletandem group 
interaction. Yeah, the, the numbers are a first impact, but to have something more robust about it that students can absorb and sort of digest throughout the semester, I think is going to be very helpful. I would like to add that uh, Anna Katarina Osterman, who is in German right now, uh, has been researching about reciprocity and she touched in this negotiation subject in a very nice way too, so it would be nice to read uh, Anna Delterman's uh, development of her post PhD work. Well, Can we wrap so up? <laughs> I think, Ludmila, it's your turn right now. I, I think we are going to close this session. But before that, uh, it's the reason that I say here, in this situation, uh, in this moment, it's the, the, um, they, they give it. It gives us the opportunity to understand uh, how telecollaboration works, yeah? So I think it's so important, this moment here, and I mean, how it, how, uh, how it help us to, to understand, yeah? Um, a lot of things, a lot of points, yeah? That's it. Ludmila, I would like to say thank you to everybody. It was an incredible debate. Uh, my special thanks to Sidney Antonio Pereira Filho, Guilherme Mariano Martins da Silva, and Lucas Menechelli Garcia da Costa. And I'm sorry for the technological problems that we had at the beginning of the session, okay? I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as I enjoy it. So, bye. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank the moderators for a great session and all of the presenters. And just add, you know, the technological problems, we call that a Zoom moment now, you know? It's, it's what it is, you know? Okay, yeah. so I'm sorry for the Zoom moment that we had <laughs> of the session. <laughs> But it was really nice. I am really happy about it. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you.